our, our next two presenters and panelists, uh, I would say fireside chat, you know, it's a different format. Uh, I would like to call on stage uh, Marissa Viveros uh, from IBM and Mohammad Awad from ARM on the stage, please. And um, I will let them introduce them. Please give them a round of applause. All right, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and... Great, um, so good morning and um, Arpit and the whole Linux team, uh, you know, great for, uh, to be here and thank you for having us uh, in this uh, important topic. So um, this is Marisa Viveros, I lead uh, within IBM all of the strategy and solution uh, development for the telco and media industry. Uh, this is a significant part of the business within IBM. Uh, and as part of my role, I've been leading with the, during the past three years, uh, all of the, uh, the IBM play and strategy within uh, network function virtualization and now uh, Telco uh, Network Cloud. So uh, this is a very appropriate uh, team. In, in addition to that, uh, I'm a member of the LFN uh, board. And uh, I just wanted to reinforce that IBM has a tremendous commitment from open source and throughout the presentation and throughout this you know, minutes that we speak here, we will see that how that has been you know, uh, represented within the market. Mahon. Thanks, thanks Arfit, thanks Marissa. Um, so my name is Mohamed Awad. I manage the, uh, the infrastructure uh, business for ARM. When we say infrastructure, we mean everything from the edge of the network all the way into the cloud data center and then into HPC. Um, you know, it's an area where we are uh, putting a tremendous amount of focus um, and, uh, and really excited about the changes happening in the ecosystem today. All right. And while we're on that topic, Thank I have you. a few slides for you. Do you mind sure. telling us your uh, sure. thought process and then we'll get into the discussion? Sure. Okay. So, uh, you know, ARM to date has shipped over 125 billion uh, processors have shipped with ARM technology. Over the last you know, uh, five or six years, more than half that number was shipped. The point is, is that's accelerating. We're seeing more and more devices um, you know, ship every year, and those devices are more, more and more um, connect connectivity as a requirement. It's being driven a lot by IoT. It's being dri driven a lot by all of these smart, intelligent endpoints looking to put data back on the network. Um, that's changing the way the infrastructure works. We're moving from an infrastructure where, which has primarily been driven um, and designed around pushing data out from the core of a data center out to billions of people, you know, with phones in their hands, watching those, you know, cat videos on Facebook or YouTube or whatever, all right? 70% of that data traffic is video today. Um, but in a world of a trillion devices, which we believe will, will happen, you know, that model changes significantly. And I want to just go through one quick example. If we talk about an HD video sensor, a billion HD video sensors, so in a world of a trillion devices, you could imagine that a billion of those devices are HD video sensors, not unlike your Nest video camera at home. A billion HD video sensors would generate about 400 exabytes of monthly bandwidth. 400 exabytes of monthly bandwidth is about three times the total internet bandwidth today. Total internet bandwidth today is about 150 exabytes. So a billion HD video sensors would swamp the current infrastructure. It would take over 40 million servers to, to, to manage all that data. That's more than the entirety of the AWS cloud. The point that I'm trying to make here is that the infrastructure is changing as more and more of these devices get on the infrastructure. How we think about uh, the infrastructure and the network has to change. Ultimately, what it means is that all along the path, whether it be that endpoint all the way up to the cloud and every point in between, data will have to be filtered, it will have to be analyzed, and it will have to be processed. This is changing the underlying compute platform all the way across. No longer can we rely on one centralized general purpose compute at the center of the data center to do all of that compute and routing and traffic management. It's going to have to happen everywhere. What open source does is it leads the way for that modularity and portability. It leads the way so that an application developer doesn't have to worry about you know, where his application is running. He, all he needs to worry about is what is the latency, what is the bandwidth, and what is the, uh, the compute. Is my service provider going to live up to those expectations? And that 
workload can then migrate across a vast array of different devices and platforms all throughout that infrastructure, whether it be at the endpoint, at the edge, or into the cloud. We've seen this happen already. We've seen people go off and make decisions where they go off and optimize different areas of that stack, whether it be, uh, whether it be open source software in the middle, which enables, um, which enables vendors to go off and create customized hardware, which can drive more and more acceleration at the lowest levels. We saw that was with Amazon, where they're doing their own custom cores now on custom silicon. But the application developer who sits on top doesn't matter to them. And that's really the point. The point is, is that you can get more customization, you can get more acceleration, you can get more efficiency by creating fit-for-purpose hardware underneath, fit-for-purpose devices all the way throughout, and workloads can move from one end to the other. We're seeing this happen more and more, and it really is the only way that we're going to be able to live up to the demands of this next generation trillion device infrastructure. Thank you. All right, Marissa, just the same way. You know, we thought it would be good to have some slides. I know, you know, a panel typically, if we just keep talking, then it, you know, you'll be on the phone. So uh, this is a better idea. <laughs> good. So let me just give you a little background. Um, so in case for, for a lot of you that do not know, uh, IBM works with about 84% of the largest web providers uh, across the world. Uh, that work, uh, it is across uh, helping them you know, really become digital organizations. And when I mean digital, it is you know, digitizing the front end processes, the support processes, uh, how they deal with clients, uh, and, and, and part of that equation is the network. I will say the fundamental part of that equation is the network. Therefore, you know, digitizing the network and making that network software is it, it becoming you know, more important uh, than ever. Uh, ARPID asked us to look at, at you know, business models here. Uh, you know, how those ecosystem business models are changing in this new environment. And I, I thought I start by saying, you know, we did a survey uh, the, about uh, six months ago, uh, and we interviewed about 200 executives throughout the world. These are all telecom executives. Half of them are still level execs. Um, what, uh, so we asked them how important is open source for them, open standards, open source uh, in, in the evolution of their, of their, of their business, uh, as well as the life cycle automation of services that are being deployed. As you can see from the, statist from, from the results here, uh, you know, customizing, it, it is very important. So having the flexibility and the agility to provide new services uh, in that environment becomes critical. The second area is lower uh, you know, development costs. And that means really tap into the shared R&D that is happening with open source in order to get the economy of scales, be more agile, and develop you know, new services in a faster manner. For me, one of the key uh, you know, uh, findings here is faster time to market. I think every one of the operators, what they want is the faster time to market, that agility to bring new services, to test services in an agile manner, uh, in an MVP, you know, in, in a minimal viable product manner, you know, test, you know, look at whether it is successful, and then go back and rework if it needs uh, refinement. But these are some of the characteristics of why uh, operators are looking at and, and, and willing to adopt open source uh, within interoperability, again, becomes a critical element of that open source adoption. Um, so um, no, these are the areas that I think as technologies and as the, as, the, as, the, as the community here, we're all working on. What I like to shift a little bit, our focus, and I, I say shift focus, and I, and I really mean balanced focus from infrastructure to service delivery. I think as a, as a community, we need to pay attention um, to the network and how we build the network in a software environment. We need to, uh, you know, to pay attention on how we you know, tap into the multi-cloud environment that everybody is, is looking at right now. How do we tap in into machine learning, AI, and all of the new technologies that are uh, available, not just for the sake of technology, but for the idea to provide that extremely good user experience to the end services. So that's what, what, a, what the operators want from us as a community, as, as companies, provide a great user experience. Furthermore, bring that great user experience. 
uh, into um, verticals. No, the revenues that are being produced from consumers, those we, we all know that those are declining on a daily basis throughout the world. Uh, you know, operators need to tap into, you know, how do they tap into um, IoT uh, and other technologies and, and you know, edge and, and, and 5G in order to provide those new solutions uh, for enterprises and, and, and really transform, you know, healthcare, retail, energy and utilities, you know, you name it, you know, all of the industries are there to be changed by this vast availability of bandwidth, lower latency uh, within this new network. So pay attention to not only the infrastructure, but also, uh, you know, how we drive that from a service delivery perspective and what services we want to deploy. I think that's fascinating. The two things I really like is uh, CapEx is not in the top three, meaning, you know, coming from a vendor myself all my life, right, I really feel good that open source is not killing a business model for vendors, right? It's, it's clear from your participation and your increased contribution that there's money to be made, and what the end users are after is not, you know, cheap. They're after innovation, they're after uh, time Absolutely. to market, you know, flexibility, customization. So that's that's a good. And the th second thing I picked up, which was really good, was the service delivery or the service experience aspect. I think we heard Armagon yesterday, who also stretched our imagination, saying that's kind of what the CXO uh, uh, people are looking at. And so for us, in the networking deep dive land, for us, a user experience is basically, you know, we get very excited when we move from CLI to a GUI, right? Let's be honest. It's like, oh, wow, you know, we don't have to do CLI. That's GUI. That's user experience has gone up, right? Take that and stretch it 10 times. That's not what we are talking about. All right. So um, with that, let me go through a few questions. Um, the first one, uh, Muhammad, um, we're in a world of heterogeneous compute, okay? And that could be from the cloud to the devices. And how do, you, how do you guide, you know, your company as well as the ecosystem to kind of balance, you know, on one hand it's interoperability, compatibility, standardization, and the other hand is differentiation. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, um, you can have heterogeneous compute, but it can still exist within a standardized framework, and I think that's really what what is required and, and really what, what drives, you know, in many cases, all new business models in and of itself, right? Being able to, to manage multiple different pieces of hardware, you know, whether it's that ruggedized end node, which is in a power constrained environment, or that big HPC server, which is sitting in the core of the data center, being able to manage those two and then quickly deploy workloads from one end of your infrastructure to the other becomes, you know, in and of itself a challenge. And, and, and we are seeing uh, companies and products emerge to kind of go address those things. I think that the key is, and one of the most important pieces of it, is having that standardized open source software in the middle enables um, the, or puts the onus on the developer of the particular pieces of hardware or the software to ensure that interoperability across the board. You know, ARM, we, we contribute over 100 open source um, just within the infrastructure business unit, over 100 open source standard projects. And we do that specifically to ensure that, you know, an ARM-based server will, 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 uh, will work as seamlessly as, you know, a, a server based on some other architecture. Okay. Yeah, so essentially what you're saying is keep the plumbing level common. Exactly. I hate to use that word, but that's the reality, yeah. right? So the plumbing level is common, layer is common, that's based on open source. Uh, and then you add your customization and differentiation. That's on, right. Uh, yeah. And because it's open source, it can quickly be modified and adapted to ensure that it stays common. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's no coincidence that uh, you know, we, have, we have the two ends of the stack on a panel, right? If you look at, and we are all networking folks, always stacks, right? He's at the bottom of the stack, right? That's Bits and bytes and chips. <laughs> And she's at the top of the stack, services, right, things like that. So uh, how do you see, you know, innovation? Like, he would prefer things to be common at the hardware, API, abstraction, OS, device driver, kind of that level. You would like to see it at the services layer, at the OSS, BSS layer. So how do you think, you know, innovation and interoperability can be balanced? Um, you know, the... 
I think it, the, the, the previous panel did a great job and the overall community is doing a great job at the standards. So while we do work at the uh, upper layers of the stack, you know, OSS, BSS, uh, as well as the business services that are being delivered, we trust that there will be the common infrastructure that will allow our clients to innovate faster. So uh, I, I think it is, is, is really that ecosystem and that, that it really needs to work together. And for me is sometimes we are uh, you know, competitors, sometimes we're partners, but that you know, it continues to be more and more um, you know, uh, inter, you know, interlaced because, because uh, we really need to provide, not, the, the, ha the software needs to run on some hardware. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, no, no matter how much we dream, the software will never you know, run on air. Yeah. So the hardware will be there to stay, and we need to have it, right? But that, you know, having that common infrastructure uh, at the lower cost that will enable and, and the agility to have, you know, the ability to have new services, that uh, accelerations, and all, the, all, all of those are needed. Fantastic. Yeah. And can you give a few examples of some of the values that have been created in the ecosystem, uh, you know, for the end users? Um, so, if, uh, one of the key examples that we have been working within IBM uh, is one uh, with um, Vodafone. And with Vodafone in Europe, we are doing several projects. Uh, one of them is we're working with them in the 5G Milan uh, testbed. And there, there are about 100 companies that have come together to enable working with uh, the Italian government, and, and you know, really sponsored by the Italian government, working to create an environment where uh, we have the infrastructure, but new services can be delivered. So if you go to the website, you will see about 100 companies dealing from healthcare companies, insurance companies, you know, all of the technologies, all of the service integrators are there, uh, all of the network equipment providers are there. Uh, as well as you know, the, the ship providers. So it's, it's you know, very, very amazing how these companies are all working together in bringing that uh, unison and accelerating the 5G deployment within this. Very nice, very nice. Any examples from your perspective on uh, either end user value created in a customer or in a project uh, that, that comes to mind from, from your, I'm sure there's like hundreds of Yeah, there's lots of them. I mean, I, you know, I think one that I gave earlier was the, um, you know, the AWS Graviton uh, yeah. announcement where they did, which, you know, in that case, what they did is, you know, because of all the work that was done on the open source side, they were basically able to go off and create their own silicon with custom acceleration in there, um, which then can go, you know, um, be transparent to the application developers, but can provide a 45%, you know, and this is what they say, 45% cost reduction as opposed to other architectures, right? Okay. Uh, one thing we have not talked about a lot is the barriers, and specifically I want to point out that some of the larger operators have people, they have vendors that they can you know, choke their necks, et cetera. Uh, what about the smaller end users, right? How do we service them? What can this community do to help uh, drive that? Uh, any ideas there? Maybe I'll start with you. Yes, so in my experience in working with operators you know, throughout the last uh, couple of years, in specifically on network transformation, uh, I see the larger operators and even, you know, I think I can count with my fingers the operators that do have a, um, engineering staff, that they do have developers, and they can rely on to, into adopting open source testing and validating which ones are good for them. Um, you know, what I see is a huge gap between those and the rest of the world where there is no engineering resources, where the engineering are so scarce that I think it, we as a community need to simplify what they should be adopting, so providing you know, componentry that they can easily adopt. But I think there is also, in, in you know, thinking about the topic is, I think we can do also you know, ourselves, you know, we can be ambassadors, to college, universities, and start bringing that team and bringing the knowledge into those new talent uh, that we can harvest from, and then create the next generation pipeline that can help you know, bring to bear those, uh, bring to, to life those, those new networks. Very nice, and, and one last round, and I know uh, we're gonna run out of time, but on security, uh, I know this is at the guts of the system that yeah. is extremely critical. Yeah. And I know you're doing everything in your power, including collaboration with your competitors yeah. uh, in the space to make sure that uh, security is well addressed. 
Uh, I know we don't, we will not have time to go through it, but give, give us a few sound bites on, on. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about security, it's an important topic, much more than I'm going to be able to cover in a couple minutes here. But you know, it, it starts at the bit and byte level, transcends the device across architectures, acceleration, all the way up to the service level, and then all the way from the device, all the way back to that core, that data center. And you know, at ARM, that's the kind of the way that we think about it. We've done things like you know, PSA and Trust Zone, but we, we don't just think about it at the device level. We actively look at what does it mean from you know, the device all the way back to that core of the data center, and how do we tie all that together so that we can create you know, a uniform amount of security. Okay, so a holistic view. Uh, we ha and you have to take a holistic view of security. It's going to require a lot of standardization. It's going to require a lot of collaboration, both with us and then, you know, quite candidly with our competitors to make sure it's done right. Awesome. In, in Mohammed, I will add, you know, security at trust, uh, transparency is, is, is a, a key attributes that everybody well is looking for. Well said. Well, very good. With that, I think we're out of time, but really appreciate your insights you. and, you know, thank you for the thank support. You. Please give thank a you. big round of applause.